Okay, well, it's six o'clock. Hello, everyone. My name is Eddie Cummins. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to uh, tonight's event. Um, as most of you know, I'm the Smart General Manager. And before we get started tonight, I just wanted to turn some time over to Director David Rabbit to welcome you on behalf of the Smart Board of Directors. So, Director Rabbit. Uh, thank you, Eddie. Appreciate that very much. And thank you all for uh, joining us this evening. I think for uh, what is the last public workshop in a series based upon our uh, 2024 strategic plan. And tonight we'll focus on freight services. And uh, I think as of what, uh, March 2022, SMART is the latest in a long line of rail freight operators in the North Bay dating back to the late 1800s. Uh, really thanks to Senator Mike McGuire who established the Great Redwood Trail between Willits and Eureka. Part of that deal was the rail corridor was transferred to SMART uh, to the Sonoma Mendocino County line and SMART now has the responsibility for providing that freight service to North Bay shipping customers. And uh, I can tell you as a Petaluma resident, I have always, always taken a keen interest in rail freight and even more so now as a supervisor because all of our current customers are based in Petaluma. Uh, rail freight is efficient, it is climate friendly, and obviously it removes many trucks from our roads and highways. It allows companies to lessen their freight costs and remain competitive in what we all know is a high cost area. And uh, again, those uh, entities, those businesses here in uh, Petaluma, a lot of animal feed, for instance, uh, the most efficient way and the cheapest way to ship uh, bulk animal feed is by rail. And I'm glad that we're be, uh, that we're able to do that. It would change our landscape if um, that opportunity uh, did not continue. So I, I really want to thank our freight manager, John Koresh, and the, the entire smart staff for their work. And I will say this, that we often get suggestions on potential customers, which is great. Uh, but please understand that John and the team have been in contact with the largest business and manufacturers along that rail corridor. And the truth is, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of business who ship by rail yet. Uh, we continue to be more proactive in ensuring smart freight operations can break even or more. Um, we look forward to being innovative in the way that we ship by rail as well. And I think we have some uh, good ideas that are out there percolating. And so I look forward to uh, hearing tonight's presentation and the questions and your participation. And again, I thank you, Eddie, for allowing me to uh, to join you at the beginning here and uh, look forward to the questions and comments uh, by those who are joining us tonight. So I'll turn it back to you, Eddie. Thank you. Now you're muted, Eddie, or I, or I wasn't supposed to turn it back to you. I'm not oh, sure. Sorry. I didn't realize I said, thank you, Director <laughs> Rabbit. And then I said, next slide, please. Sorry, <laughs> I was wondering why it wasn't moving forward. Sorry about that. So here's tonight's workshop agenda. We're gonna go over some workshop ground rules. We'll talk about the strategic planning process just a little bit. Talk about the timeline to complete this project. Also wanted to look back to 2022, talk about some prior planning activities um, and some, among some other things. Um, talk about those pathway listening sessions, or sorry, this is a type of freight listening session. Um, that we had back then um, and what we learned from that and what we what we had established. And then I just wanted to provide a freight update and some additional information. And then we'll get into the heart of tonight's workshop of talking about strategy development for freight. And then at the end, um, we will do an open discussion where we'll be able to hear from each of you. Next slide, please. So meeting ground rules, uh, when you wish to speak, please use the raise hand feature. Raise your hand, go to reactions and click raise hand. Uh, keep your mic muted until you're called upon to speak. Stay focused on the question at hand. Keep an open mind, be respectful of others' ideas, be considerate and allow time for others to speak. I don't have a timer on here tonight, but we're just asking everybody to follow the two minute rule. Next slide, please. We will be using Mentimeter. This will be an opportunity to collect uh, some information from you. We'll have like a word cloud and different things that'll pop up on the screen in real time. Uh, to use this, you can do one of two things. You can scan um, the QR code over on the left-hand side, or you can simply go to minty.com 
and enter the access code 27036659. And I'll give everybody just a minute if they want to get this pulled up. And it looks like we are putting a link uh, to Mintimeter in the chat. So if you want to go to that, you can click the link as well. And you do not need to download the app. Um, you can simply just scan the QR code or go to minty.com. And we'll have another opportunity um, where we'll bring up these QR codes and the address um, in a future slide. Next slide, please. So smart strategic plan, um, what is a strategic plan? Well, it helps define the strategic direction of the organization, helps us establish goals, objectives, and actions that are in line with SMART's vision and mission, uh, promotes collaboration, collective responsibility, and probably most importantly, accountability. Um, the 2019 strategic plan was adopted in November of 2019, and it's required to be updated every five years. Next slide, please. So here's the strategic plan process. Um, we start with refining objective areas, uh, helps, we'll establish goals, strategies, and actions. From there, we will draft the strategic plan. And then by later uh, in 2024, we will finalize uh, the what we'll call the 2024 strategic plan. Next slide. So here's the overall timeline. You can see um, work we did starting in, on January 31st, where we did the SWOT analysis and we reviewed our strategic objectives. In February, we had two workshops, one on ridership, one on pathways. And then in March, we did uh, uh, the extensions workshop. Tonight, we're here doing freight. And we also had a COC workshop on uh, with COC, which is our Citizens Oversight Committee. Uh, they had a workshop on March 13th. Um, April through July, uh, we plan to get out and, uh, and present, do some community presentations, gather additional feedback from the community. Um, August, community presentations. There will also be a, a, a Citizens Oversight Committee workshop um, on August 14th, 2024. And then September through October, again, more community presentations and we will be, uh, begin uh, drafting the strategic plan. November and December, COC will finalize the draft 2024 strategic plan, and we anticipate board approval likely at our December board meeting uh, at the end of 2024. Next slide, please. So I always think it's important to look back at what we've done in the past. There's been a lot of prior planning activities. Obviously, we had the 2019 strategic plan. Um, in early 2022, uh, we did some strategic planning with the board. Uh, where we went through and identified, did a SWOT analysis, really looking at the agency's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. We did a series of listening sessions on each of our strategic objectives. And ultimately, the board used all of that information to create what we refer to as the Smart House, uh, which we'll deep dive into on the next slide. Next slide, please. So this is what we refer to as the smart house. It identifies our values, which are the foundations of our house, the foundation of our house. It's our values are safety, integrity, stewardship, and continuous improvement. Our strategic objectives are those things that are really important, those big rocks that the agency uh, needs to accomplish. And those are ridership, pathways, extensions, and freight. Um, the smart house provides our mission statement, which is simply we connect communities and the vision is smarter transportation for a smarter future. Next slide, please. So when we look back at those listening sessions of 2022, the kind of the top five themes that we heard about were building new sightings, expanding the freight territory, marketing the advantage of shipping by rail, <laughs> create public private partnerships and upgrade the existing line to the North. Next slide, please. So from that information, we did come up with a few strategies. I'll talk about strategies as well as some of the results we achieved. Acquire new business, expand service to existing customers. Uh, we talked about new potential customers north of Airport Station and the importance of building uh, public-private partnerships and creating rail spurs and potentially transload sites. Uh, we talked about examining freight tariffs and consider increasing fees. 
we needed to reduce car hire fees, and we needed to manage our, our maintenance requirements on the rail line. So some of the results, we did have a couple of new customers. There was nothing significant, um, but we did serve a couple of new customers, which is PG&E and Altrust. Uh, we did attempt, we had, we had some long conversations with a potential partner uh, for a spur grant that we had. It was limited time public funds. Uh, we really needed to move quickly on that. And unfortunately, we were not um, able to secure that, that deal at the time. Um, on a positive note, we did reduce car hire fees by 66% in FY24 versus FY23. So we've done a lot of improvements there. And I'm really proud of, of our freight team, of just the amount of maintenance that they've done over the past couple of years. Um, bridges, tracks, crossings, equipment. Um, there, were, there were several things out there that needed to be repaired and our, our team has done a really, really um, great job in this area. Next slide, please. So just some smart freight facts. Um, smart freight consists of six employees. Um, we have one leased and three owned locomotives. Unfortunately, two of those locomotives are not operational as of today. Um, we have 23 miles of track. We operate from uh, Napa River to Nevada, and we've owned the Brazos branch since 2003, and we assumed freight operations in March of 2022. We currently have three regular customers in Petaluma, Hunt and Barron's, Lagunitas Brewing Company, and Dairyman's Feed and Supply Company. And overall, in uh, 2023, we delivered 558 rail cars. Next slide. Operation of the freight service. Uh, we run two round trips from Petaluma, uh, two Petaluma customers after revenue passenger service. And we also do two round trips to Cal Northern to receive and deliver rail cars to and from the interchange. We do weekly track inspections to comply with FRA requirements, weekly locomotive servicing, weekly track repairs and maintenance, and monthly on-track equipment uh, servicing and repairs. Next slide, please. So, I, you know, Director Rabbit brought this up, but I think it's important of, of what, are the, what are some of the other benefits associated with freight? And one of those is the environmental benefits that doesn't get talked about enough. Um, many of you probably know this, but each freight car is equivalent to three semi-trucks taken off the highways. Smart freight can help businesses and cities grow greener. It's a fact. And we are currently working internally um, to make smart freight locomotive fleet as clean as possible. We have secured partial funding from a federal Chrissy grant uh, for the purchase of three tier four, uh, tier four locomotives. So working towards that, still have a funding gap there to uh, solve, but we're working towards it. Next slide, please. So what are some of the challenges, you know, and as we, you know, it's always hard to talk about the challenges that we have, but I think anytime you're putting together strategic plans, things that you need to be aware of, you need to think through. State of good repair is, a, is, a, is one of those challenges. Uh, we have se several bridges that have been repaired, several more that need to be repaired. We still have some deferred track maintenance, track surfacing, tie replacement, and great crossing repairs that need to be done. Um, similar with our locomotives, as I previously mentioned, we have one lease locomotive and three owned locomotives. Uh, 1501 is our lease locomotive. It is currently operational. 2611 is operational um, as of just a few weeks ago. Uh, 2009 requires complete engine overhaul and 007 needs traction motors and an electrical upgrade. And one of the things that we always have to have on our radar here um, are the future requirements uh, for tier four and zero emission um, that have been established by CARB. And so that needs to also be on our radar as we create uh, the 2024 strategic plan. Next slide, please. Uh, some additional challenges that we have with the freight line flooding. We have significant flooding both at Shellville and Novato. This is something we experience every, every winter. And um, you know, so at some point, you know, we do have to consider how do we get these tracks raised uh, in the future. Budget has also been a challenge for us, operating revenue versus uh, operating expenditure deficit. Uh, we currently have a deficit of around $500,000 annually, and we still have plenty of capital requirements, which are bridge and track repairs um, that need to be done in the future. Next slide, please. You know, a lot of times, you know, people say, well, you just need to 
to move more money to freight. And that's easy to say, but the challenge that we have is, and a lot of people don't understand this, and this is why I put up this slide, is Measure Q cannot be used for freight. Uh, Measure Q and uh, specifically says to provide funding for the design, construction, implementation, operation, financing, maintenance, and management of a passenger rail system and a bicycle pedestrian pathway connecting the 14 rail stations from Cloverdale to Larkspur. And so, again, it's just one of those challenges that we have, and we often receive that feedback is that we simply need to uh, move more money towards freight. Next slide, please. So here are the smart freight financials, um, operations revenue. Um, this is FY24, this is the latest and greatest. Operations revenue is about uh, uh, 1,349,000 and our expenses are anticipated to be around 1.9, leaving us with a deficit this year of about 590, oh, 593,000. So overall, um, it goes without saying, but our goal is to ensure smart freight is financially sustainable. And again, um, just to point out that Measure Q funds cannot subsidize freight. Next slide, please. Again, um, cost exceeding revenue. Um, obviously, there are some ideas to close the funding gap. Number one, secure new customers, uh, request additional state funding, take advantage of storage opportunities. And as I mentioned before, examine freight tariffs and consider increasing fees. I think the important thing to remember is that SMART does have a common carrier obligation. Um, we have to continue to, to find ways to deliver that freight. And um, if we weren't able to close our funding gap, obviously we need to allow our board enough time to make decisions um, you know, through that process. So something to think about. Next slide, please. So one of the ways, um, obviously, that would help is to take advantage of our, our freight storage area. Um, freight storage, we have two sites. We have the Shellville Yard. It has two tracks, about 160 car capacity. And then we have the Burdell siding. Uh, it's about, it has about a 40 car capacity. I'm seeing a hand raise. Mike, did you have something you needed to say real quick? Mike Arnold? Okay, maybe not. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So when we look at freight storage, a um, lot of different types of rail cars that are out there. Um, you know, when we talk to the, the, the storage brokers that are out there, the really the thing that, that pops up that there's um, a real need for in our area is, is tank cars. And um, so, you know, that, there's, that, that's, that's a big part of the market that we have in this area. Next slide, please. Now, the current status for our freight storage, November 17, 2021, um, a smart board of directors suspended LPG storage. Our previous storage revenue was about 500,000 annually. That included storage switching in and out, as well as inspections. Um, FY23 storage revenue is about $9,000. So a significant difference between um, 500,000 annually and $9,000. Um, you know, I've been to uh, talk to several uh, folks in the Shellville area. I've been to a community meeting um, and they're very clear. The Shellville community is not supportive of LPG storage. Um, I am happy to report that we recently signed an agreement with Caltrain to store cars and locomotives through June 25. Um, so that's going to bring in some uh, some revenue there. Obviously won't close the overall funding gap, but uh, does bring in some revenue. Next slide, please. Okay, this is where we are going to start asking for your input. Um, we have a, a few questions that we'll ask via Mintimeter. And then uh, for the grand finale tonight, we will open it up and everyone will uh, be able to speak. While everybody is uh, uh, bringing Minty up, either scanning the uh, QR code or, um, or going to minty.com and typing in the access code of 2703-6659. Um, I'll turn some time over. Mike Arnold, did you have something you needed to yeah, say? Yeah, I did. I forgot to un unmute the microphone. Uh, go ahead. So the story is right now, the operating deficit is being covered by state funds. 
And those state funds, I'm sure you and Heather have a forecast as to just exactly when those state funds are going to run out. You are prohibited, according to what you have said, and I, I agree with you, that you're prohibited from using Measure Q funds to operate freight trains. What are you guys talking about regarding what you're going to do? One is, of course, you could try to go get more state funds to subsidize the operating deficits. That's clearly something I think anybody would think of. Right. But you may not get it. And that federal obligation of providing freight service looms over the entire agency regarding the obligation of continuing to provide the freight service. How are you guys going to wiggle out of this dilemma? We're working on it. Yeah. Working well, on it. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, I think a lot of that's going to come out tonight, Mike. I mean, we're talking about how do we move forward? Obviously, you know, if you back up to the slide that I presented um, just a couple of slides ago, I mean, there's there's a few opportunities. Um, and and we, number one, get more customers. That's been difficult, but we're trying. We're going to talk more about that here tonight. Obviously, state funds are, are a possibility. Um, taking advantage of our storage track, um, you know, there's a real opportunity there as well. So there's all these different things that we're working on. And that's all we can do is just continue to work on it. Yeah, but at some point, the, the state funds might run out and you're going to have to make a decision that it would be good to inform the public, you know, what are you going to do yeah. that, under that scenario? I yeah. mean, getting additional customers. I mean, John Williams was running this thing for 10 years. He only had four customers when yeah. when he passed. So and let's continue on, Mike. Five. Yeah. Let's, I'll give you some time at the end, but we, okay. we really need to stay focused on this. We have a lot of people here. Okay. Okay, so let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so our first question tonight, what are the biggest challenges facing smart freight? And you can just type in uh, your things and we'll, what'll happen here is a word cloud will pop up. Okay, so just a few things popping up here. Customers is at the very center. Deficit, revenue, funding, access, fixing the northern track, store LPG, aging infrastructure, the board, fixing northern track, business growth, aging infrastructure, neighbor, areas of service limited, Okay, a few things are still coming in. Store LPG. Customers is still the most bold. Shellville residents, uniformed, limited spares, capital improvements, sea level rise, limited market, resistance from community. Okay, thank you. Looks like we've slowed down, received 21 responses. That's good. Can we go to the next question, please?
So the question, the second question is, how can the North Bay make the most of its existing freight infrastructure? And this is your opportunity to type a few things in, um, and it'll pop up on the screen again as you uh, as you hit submit. A, acting boldly and intelligently, storage, approved safe storage, all garbage and recycling, link to the National Railroad and create more spurs as customer incentive, educate the public, maintain and preserve freight system for the future, pursue grants. We need to get more loads shifted from trucks onto the rail, otherwise we are not meeting our potential. Partner with Shortline to extend track. Except for Shellfill and Burdell, there, are no, there is no freight infrastructure. Making shipping green was smart, rail cool for business. Serve multiple customers per switch, revenue split from excursions. Reconnect existing spurs, improve infrastructure resiliency. High fees for trucks. This is great. Three things, add spurs where there is business, approve safe storage of LPGs and elevate the track, get public agencies to give bonus points for shipping with smart. Is there more down there? There we go. Educate the public on the value of freight on rails. Okay, it looks like we've slowed down. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, this is the last minty question. Um, how should SMART engage businesses to start thinking about freight service? Partner to construct spurs, start talking to B Corp certifiers, B Corp businesses to use freight rail, aggressive marketing and outreach, transload facilities, however they learn about other transport options, learn what the shippers want and need, more freight for new breweries and their suppliers. Host an open house and invite business. Focus on regional connections. There are businesses that can be connected um, through just Cal Northern or Napa and SMART. Targeted outreach. Targeted meetings with potential or existing freight customers. Any more? Push transload locations, combine shipping needs with multiple light, multiple light businesses.
what can offer, what can SMOT offer that truckers cannot. Talk to commercial realtors about opportunities, do a collective with breweries to ship. Combine shipping needs with multiple, I already read that one, like businesses. Leverage transload for common customers, brewery, recycle, and warehousing. Okay. Okay, looks like we've slowed down. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so this is uh, public feedback time. Uh, please remember, raise your hand to speak, keep an open mind, be respectful of others, and allow time to, for others to speak. Again, ask you to follow that two minute rule. Um, you know, this is open mic. Um, we're here to uh, to hear from you, um, but there are there are some questions that I think that you know we need to think about, um, and you know as we develop the strategic plan, we need to be prepared to uh, create strategies around these things. And so, a few of those questions are: How does Smart close the immediate funding gap to ensure sustained freight operations? What freight opportunities exist on the current alignment north of airport on the current alignment and north of airport? Where should SMART consider transload uh, site locations? Um, what opportunities exist to create public-private partnerships? And this is, a, this is one, you know, what is SMART's primary mission, right? So overall, SMART's mission that we showed with the SMART House was we connect communities. But that doesn't necessarily relate directly to freight. So as I think as we create um, uh, this piece of the strategic plan, we need to be very clear about what is Smart Freight's primary mission. So any of your thoughts on any of these types of questions on top of uh, your other advice, uh, we'd love to hear it. So um, we will start with uh, David Schombrum. Thank you. Uh, well, it looks like uh, you've done a lot of work on maintenance, but uh, essentially, um, there's no practical effect in terms of adding new customers. And so three of us got together to develop a plan that was uh, would be readily implementable. I sent it to Eddie a week ago to give him time to think about it. Uh, it proposed using the existing Fulton Spur as a transload site and so it has the features that are needed, access to road, uh, it has a PTC switch, it has track capacity, it has space for trucks. Um, and so I want to know from you, Eddie, what do you think about the real, realism of that proposal? Can you implement it tomorrow? I think it's something that needs to be evaluated further. Um, I think that's not was, good enough, Eddie. Come on, you had a week. Whoa, hold up, hold up. No, we have to evaluate it further. We have some concerns. We have some concerns about trucks being able to get in and out and be able to turn around. We've looked at this site with other partners in the in the past, and that's some of the concerns they brought up. And so, if you're going to come up with something, you need to know that it's going to work, and you need to know that it's it's going to be effective. And so we're not going to do that just tomorrow, right? It's something that needs to be evaluated. And we're here tonight to create a strategic plan to look at things like that. I will consider it, but I can't tell you that I'm going to start tomorrow. Well, what I had wanted to hear was what the uh, 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 strategic objections or uh, obstacles could be, and you've just named one. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay, next would be Matt at Lodge. Uh, my question had to do with um, the zoning around the uh, around tracks in Santa Rosa. Um, we've seen several locations that are kind of trackside be uh, reclassified by local agencies. Uh, 
The one that I'm thinking of right, right off the top of my head is the asphalt plant there off of uh, college. Um, is the smart uh, freight division working with local um, you know, cities and, and the county to try and keep some of these properties um, industrial, heavy commercial, so that they lend themselves to freight business? Eddie, you're muted. Thanks. Uh, what I was saying was, is we, we partner closely with the cities and the counties and work through those things. So anytime that there's something going on, generally we do have a seat at the table where they reach out, talk to us, and we can talk about those types of things and what the future holds and you know what, what our plans are. So yeah, we definitely have those conversations. Okay, next up is Richard Brand. Yeah, hi, Eddie. Thanks for doing this. Uh, I was surprised last night I was up at... Uh, Windsor Park, uh, Shiloh Industrial Park, and your contractor, Stacy Whitbeck, is storing cross ties there now. And so to your issue, your question, what freight opportunities exist on the Colonel Lyman and north of airport, your own materials are being trucked in to that area and stored and uh, the industrial site is being paid uh, for this. I don't know if you know that, it's about two weeks ago, but I just wanted to fill you in. That's an opportunity once the line is done. And I understand you're not uh, active yet, but I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Yep, very good. Thank you. Um, let's go with Mike Strider, Michael Strider. Uh, Eddie, yeah, I got about two hours worth of things to talk about, but I'll, 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 I'm going to, hey, just so, <laughs> just so everybody's clear, I'm going to give you a link at the end that you can send us stuff, right? Because we do, yeah. we are limited to an hour, but I will give you a link where you can give me everything. That's fine. Um, I just wanted to point out that, you know, the the Todd Spur, which was cut off when Smart came through, uh, there near milepost, uh, what is it? Uh, um, 50, 51 or something like that. Anyway, uh, the, the, that is still in and it goes to the, the, the recology people there and they just read in the newspaper that they just expanded their recycling um, center there uh, to process more stuff. Um, that might be a potential freight customer. Um, I would knock on their door to say, hey, we can save you some bucks if you ship by rail. So uh, thank you. That, that and future garbage, if Sonoma County ever, you know, gets smart enough to figure out that uh, they, they can only go so far. But anyway, that's, that's all I got on, on that. But I'll send you more stuff than that. Okay, you know, great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Bell. Oh, hi, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, could you talk in general about the uh, safety of allowing the LPG uh, storage tankers? Uh, why I think they're why I think they're safe. Yes, that and and what the issues are, or the issue, or maybe the issues. Yeah, are, you know. Are related. I, Listen, I don't. I don't really want to get into that. Um, you know, the, the LPG tankers are stored all throughout our area. You can drive along the freeways and the highways. You see the LPG tankers stored out there. Um, but I can tell you that the community in that area is just absolutely not supportive. Um, I went to a community meeting in Sonoma Valley. Um, there were probably forty to fifty people that showed up. Um, this is something that I have not taken back to the board yet. Um, you know, it, it, it may be a, a conversation piece at some time uh, that the board needs to discuss, but um, we've met a lot of resistance and it's been a, it's been, you know, it's, it's been a tough situation. Obviously, you know, we're looking at it, um, you know, from, from obviously from a safety and a revenue perspective, um, but the community, you know, at the end of the day, smart smart exists to serve the community, and that makes this uh, particular issue very tough. Thank you. Yep. Okay, Mike Pegner. Well, I kind of answered my question, Eddie. Um, I was wondering if and when uh, the LPG um, will be decided, or if it will be decided. Um, as you know, that uh, was done by uh, John Williams and NWP Co. 
uh, and one of the reasons why the freight railroad was um, financially successful before uh, the LPG left. Um, as you know, I talked um, at that meeting with you. I thought your presentation was excellent and brought out the fact that um, LPG sitting by itself uh, is no more dangerous than any other freight car. Uh, there's no ignition source. Um, it is similar to uh, going camping and having an LPG um, tank uh, attached to your um, a camp, your camper, your uh, three burner stove that you would take camping. And uh, you have an open flame uh, that uh, comes out of the uh, uh, camper stove. And of course, uh, there's no threat of an explosion from that. So the LPG freight um, safety factor uh, is very high. The only problem uh, that there has been in the past, which FRA has now fixed over the last several years, is providing LPG cars with an extra layer or shell uh, that protects them uh, from uh, becoming um, a dangerous uh, missile, or I wouldn't say missile, but a, a, a dangerous um, uh, tank car. Uh, the extra uh, shielding um, prevents the uh, LPG from getting out, and it's not a problem. I, I just, I mean, the thing is that bothers me is that if we have everybody uh, that doesn't like this or doesn't understand that or whatever, uh, there's no hope for freight rail. Thank you. Yep. Danny, Danny Sheehan. I'm going to kind of stick my neck out here because I don't understand um, regarding the Mendocino Railroad. And I know that SMART has no interest in carrying freight past Cloverdale, but is there an opportunity to meet up with the Mendocino Railroad at Cloverdale to create a freight connection? And if it's not an appropriate question, you don't have to answer. Yeah, I think my focus is my focus is 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 on what Smart does, and that's to the that's to the to the county line essentially, right, Cloverdale. So that's what we're focused on. You know, there's other efforts. Um, you know, I don't want to get into the political side of things of the Great Redwood Trail and all those things, but my focus is is to Cloverdale, and that's what uh, that's what we're working towards. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Matt, did, did you have another question? Yes, I uh, I was wondering, what does it cost us to uh, reconnect some of these old spurs? Is it is it a hundred thousand? Is it a million dollar project? You know, kind of ballpark. What, yeah, what it really cost? depends. It really depends on what the length is and the and and how complicated it is. I mean, you know, if it's a if it's a lengthy spur, you can you can spend a million, two million, pretty easily. Okay, thank you. Yeah, definitely not cheap. Uh, Mike Arnold. Okay, so uh, I'm in agreement with Mike Peckner, <laughs> uh, believe it or not, and what. <clears throat> The problem partly is, is the public does not understand about uh, shipping by freight versus shipping by truck. Shippers understand that difference, and I'm sure they've evaluated whether or not it, they'd save money. And you've got a few customers who figured out that they will save money in, to their, in their interest shipping by freight. But most of the comments regarding marketing suggest that Gee whiz, the businesses in Sonoma County don't know anything about SMART and that the, the freight train's coming through and they don't even consider it. And the answer really is, it's about a business. And there are websites on shipping by freight versus shipping by truck, what should shippers consider? And my guess is most of the people that need to ship out of the county look at those websites and do an evaluation to decide it's cheaper to ship by truck. And there isn't a lot SMART can do about that. Which means if SMART is going to solve the operating deficit, the parking of tanker cars is a critical component of that business. As NWP Co., you know, 
it's an estimate, but about half the revenues were associated with the parking of tanker cars. And it just seems to me that this issue needs to be addressed directly. I understand the community in Sonoma Valley is worried about them exploding, but you know, there are people who don't believe in vaccines. In case that's the end of my comment. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Anybody else wish to speak tonight? I'll add something to that if I can, Eddie. Um, and I agree with Mike Arnold. Um, <laughs> we have to put in a switch at Shiloh. Um, there has to be some way to get the money, uh, $600,000 or a million dollars. Um, the previous administration was not supportive of rail. And before that, Lillian Haynes, who was the first uh, general manager of SMART, came from a light rail mentality in Portland, Oregon. And she never thought, she didn't even know that the freight had run before she got there. And of course, that played into um, some of the plans uh, to construct SMART. But I think that at least, if nothing else, either the Fulton uh, Spur or the Shiloh Spur, especially the Shiloh, the industrial park, uh, needs to be reconnected as soon as uh, the track is laid up there. You need something like that to attract business. I realize that there might not be anything uh, right now, but we have to have uh, what we used to have on the NWP um, are what they call house tracks. They used to be house tracks at every uh, city along the right-of-way, Ignacio, Novato, Petaluma, Santa Rosa, Fulton, Windsor, Asti, Shiloh, Geyserville, Cloverdale. There is no place for cars to come in and no place for cars to be loaded out. And until that's done, freight is a dead issue. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jack Swearingen. All right, thanks, Eddie. Um, I need to actually build on something that Mike Arnold had contributed. I never thought I'd be at this point, but I am. Hi, right, Mike. Uh, risk perception is a field of study. Risk perception. Uh, it's different from calculating risk. The issue is much more sociological. It's how is risk perceived by the public? And a lot of things have come and gone, not ever being able to, because of fear of the public, which is exactly what we have in Shellville and South Sonoma County, uh, Sonoma Valley. There are books on this topic. They're not as mathematical as you might fear, but I was exposed to that uh, in the issue of shipping nuclear material, uh, weaponized and waste. And there was a public hysteria about that, as there is about many things. But by accessing the subfield of risk perception, much progress might be made in communicating the relative safety of this issue to the public. I think it'd be worth a try. Okay, thank you, Jack. Uh, Joe Mueller. Mueller, sorry. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, you're great. Yes. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate you on getting that Caltrain contract. That sounds like that is basically brought in or will be bringing in a good stream of revenue for the next year and also kind of solves the issue of, well, now we don't have or will be filling up some of those tracks in Shellville. Uh, my first question is, is has it hasn't been brought up directly, but uh, is has it been looked at of storing uh, LPG cars at Burdell? That seems to be a rather uh, there. Nobody exactly lives within close uh, distance of there. It's next to the landfill, which regularly burns off gases in their burner there. Uh, so the the uh, and stores some of it for use of there. So it's something that there is well uh, in the area. Um, did. I don't know if you have can answer any of that tonight. Yeah, obviously we've looked at Burdell as well. I mean, the the, the I think the real challenge there is that 
we could do it and it's some level of revenue and it's maybe something yeah. we'll look at in the future. But I'm the, just asking if it's been looked yeah. at. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. But I think that the big the big storage area obviously yeah. is the Shellville area. And you know, what would be the market if somebody could only bring you 40 cars versus right. 150 or whatever, right? So yeah. it's just it's looking at that as as to whether or not a uh, storage broker would see that as uh, as appealing. All right. Um I... I'm two other things. Uh first I'm going to second uh Mr. Peckner's uh observation there that I think it's paramount that SMART uh, reconnect something either up at Fulton or especially at uh, the Shiloh Park there, but I believe it's now known as Pruitt Industrial Park. I know that they have a batch asphalt plant that has re recently started there as well as uh, it's been used in the past for transload. It has much uh, a almost direct highway connection there. And I think it's worthwhile for SMART to do that, especially considering uh, it's relatively, it's at the end of the line there. So it's not, there's no reason it can't be reconnected other than that the funding needs to be programmed from the appropriate place. I understand why it was not put in the bidding package for the extension, the Windsor extension, but I, strongly, strongly urge you to look at getting that in because clearly that is a customer that did exist before and you have development in that area. Uh, the only other thing I had to add is that uh, I'm going to put in my two cents here that you have a entity that you're working with that is willing to both run and share uh, revenue from excursions on the smart line. And while that is not necessarily the big money of car storage, that is an income source. And I would urge you to take a look at that and see if there is a way of getting some of that to help fill some of that funding gap. It may not fill at all, but any money in the bank is good. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, David. I wanted to speak a bit more about LPG storage. Um, I think an appropriate analogy to what we're faced with here is uh, the Salem witch uh, crisis. Um, there was a mass hysteria that, there. Uh, I believe that's what we're facing here. It's based uh, purely on emotion. There is no uh, substantive uh, reason for concern. Um, and people simply uh, are not willing to be reasonable. Um, and I think, I think you need to be thinking about this situation with that kind of a frame. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Richard Brand. Uh, yes, once again, uh, since there was some more comment about the Pruitt area, Eddie, that Pruitt is about a quarter, uh, three quarters of a mile from the existing active railway on the rebuild. There's action going on to rebuild the bridges there. But that I talked to the general manager there last night, as Matt had said, this is a real possibility. Bodine has to move out of Santa Rosa. This is one of the places they're going to go. I think, and in my industry, Alexander Valley Sellers and Kendall Jackson would love to ship on rail. But I think this is the issue. Please, uh, and I know John has looked at this too. But by the way, John, good job on 2611. But this is a real opportunity in the next year to get when this thing connected on the lower end of the construction project. Thank you. Thank you. David, did you have something else or did you just not put your hand down? Okay. Anybody else have anything they would like to share tonight? Um.
Okay. Wait, Eddie. Oh, Richard, uh, go yeah. ahead. Oh, Supervisor Rabbit, go ahead. <laughs> I'm oh, done. You're on mute. You're on mute. But Eddie, I appreciate the uh, conversation and I appreciate everyone's participation. I do think that, um, can you, and I put it in chat, I'm not sure if you saw it, but I was just asking you to uh, expand upon, and maybe everyone in this crowd already knows this, but the common carrier obligations, what that entails, if SMART were to perhaps farm out freight to a short line, how that would um, interact with passenger service and what we would have to uh, do to make sure that we were compatible. Um, and then I, second, my second one is more of a comment and I appreciate the conversation. And I do remember the uh, suspension of LPG storage was, was presented to be temporary and a good faith effort was made to identify al alternate storage opportunities. I think the Caltrain uh, locomotives and um, cars is a, is a great opportunity. I know that we had talked about some vegetable yeah. oil tankers and uh, among others. Um, of course, the yeah. revenue you receive from those cars is not the same as you receive from a tanker car. And to Eddie's point, it is true that we're a unique public entity as opposed to a railroad. What you see over along 580 and um, I don't know, is that Emeryville? Um, you know, tanker cars are parked along along the road right next to high rise apartment buildings. And uh, there was no community interaction there. Um, but yet we are a different entity. So I'm acknowledging that and, and understanding the uh, the situation. Um, so I look forward to that, but maybe if you could just touch on the common carrier obligation, I, I do think that it's important that we control our own destiny because it has a lot to do with how we maintain our track, especially a single, a single track system. So Eddie, please. Yeah. So we do have common carrier obligation, which means we have to continue to deliver freight, right? That, that just, that's just simply stated. Um, you know, if, if, if smart were to have to, um, no longer be able to run operations, we would have to apply to the STB, the Surface Transportation Board. And likely one of the first questions that they would ask is, oh, well, would another short line want to come in and take this over? Um, if that happens, that obviously creates a, a lot of additional issues and challenges with scheduling, things of that nature. Right now, obviously, we work well. Uh, smart Freight and Smart Passenger work very well together, coordinate schedules and things like that. Um, but bringing in another freight operator would obviously create um, some challenges that um, um, that we really don't want to see. So um, at the end of the day, it's important that we we figure out how to solve this problem, how we continue to create operations, continue to deliver on our on our uh, on our common carrier obligation, and and keep uh, keep freight rail um, operational. Mike Peckner, do you have another statement? Yeah, just a uh, something I thought about um, going back to Shiloh, and I I know I sent you pictures when you first came uh, mm -hmm. to hear that um, uh, Redwood National Lumber Company in Cloverdale uh, used to transload at Shiloh. Um, one of the other businesses that has been shut out when the switch was removed um, was a large um, uh, lumber. Uh, transload. Um, I believe it's uh, Friedman's Lumber um, was bringing in uh, dimensional loads on freight cars, and then they go out of, out uh, to their uh, several of their uh, local um, businesses, Friedman's Lumber, uh, and it was trucked from uh, Shiloh. Uh, to uh, Friedman's Lumber in Sonoma, Friedman's Lumber, I think, in Novato, the ones that are close by. Right. So that business is lost. And um, the other thing I saw uh, just recently is that Sayer, which used to do a lot of business with the uh, NWP, and, and, and John Carouche knows this, uh, they're sitting on a um, uh, lease from... Sonoma County for 15 million cubic yards of Russian River gravel. And that's what the business that they used to be in. Um, that lease will, is still there. Sayer is going to be sold. 
Yeah. And and somebody else will take over that business, and uh, they should be offered uh, freight. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, sand and gravel business to be shipped by uh, rail instead of uh, trucks. Thank Got you. It. Thank you. Okay, we're just at seven o'clock. David, did you have one last thing? Uh, this is quick. Uh, this is in response to Supervisor Rabbit. Um, he pointed out the unique challenge of being a public agency and being in business. And I raised that as a concern at the time uh, that the decision was made to buy the freight business. I, I had grave doubts at the time and um, nothing that has happened since then um, has shown me uh, that um, public agency and business um, uh, can successfully work together. So I I would love to see you succeed at this. Let's let's go out and get them. Okay, thank you, David. Next slide, please. Okay, so we want your participation and input. Um, we have a, a, a link up here. We will put that in the chat. So for those of you that want to provide additional information, this is a place that you can send it, and we can collect all that info and be able to use that as we create the uh, strategic plan. Uh, the upcoming workshop that we have, uh, we have the COC workshop coming up on August 14th. And as I mentioned earlier, spring and summer of 24 will be ongoing community outreach. Um, the fall, in fall 24, we will draft the plan and do a public uh, workshop. And then in the winter of 2024, we will finally complete the uh, 2024 strategic plan. So with that, I would like to thank everybody. I really appreciate um, everyone attending, uh, coming in and providing this information. I think this is going to help us as we move forward developing our strategic plan. Um, in regards to freight. So thank you all. Have a great night and uh, be safe. See you later. Yeah, thanks. Good night. Yep.